Now that we've created a very simple power-up system, let's turn our attention over to attachments for our ship. In this video, we will be creating an attachment class. And basically, an attachment is nothing more than an extension of the ship class. Now, with attachments, we can further extend them into things such as sidearms. So the objective of this video is to simply create sidearms for our ship. Now, it would be nice if those sidearms could take damage themselves and be destroyed such that you could end up with one sidearm that has been damaged and completely removed while still having the other one that is active. Now, please note, in this video, we're not going to focus on getting the actual weapon functionality in place for the sidearm. We're just getting the base infrastructure set up and getting it so that it can be destroyed. And we'll be focusing on its firing capabilities in the next video. Exactly. We'll be working on this branch of the class hierarchy in Space Fighter. Once we've got that branch established, we can make a sidearm begin on things like collision, the fact that you can see it, and the fact that it follows the ship around. But we'll be getting on to actual weapon systems in a subsequent video. Now, I'd also like to point out that we're not going to be taking these sidearms and wrapping them up into some sort of power-up or basically having a power-up apply sidearms as a part of its apply functionality when a player ship runs into that particular power-up. Though I'm sure after watching this video, you can come up with all sorts of uh, very simple ideas to employ a power-up system or the power-up system that we have walked through here and created into giving sidearms to a ship. So let's get started. Uh, before we actually begin on the attachment branch of the class hierarchy, let's get some of the settings in place that we'll need for the sidearms themselves. So we'll begin in the config class. We'll jump down the line and we'll get the necessary sprite sheet set up and then assign a value for sidearm health. For the sprite sheet, I'm going to once again copy an existing sprite sheet field, which will change to sidearm sprite sheet. And the asset name for the sidearm sprite sheet is simply sidearm. And as far as animation parameters are concerned, there aren't any. It is a single tile, and in this case, is very much a placeholder graphic. Again, the sidearms are simply going to be that small triangular graphic. And we will, in this case, though, I've copied this sprite sheet from the health sprite sheet, which had no damage texture. In this case, the, sidearm, the idea of the sidearm is it is a damageable entity. It is something that can take damage, and if enough damage is sustained, it will explode just like the owning mothership. So we're actually going to take out the setting for no damage texture. That way, of course, we'll get the familiar flicker effect whenever a sidearm is damaged. Now, one more field we need is the field that will hold how much health a sidearm begins with or spawns with. So we'll make a public static field of integer type that will be called sidearm health. And that will be set to a value of 5. And I'm setting it to a very low value because one of the key things we want to make sure we establish is that the sidearms can properly be destroyed independent of things like the base ship and any other sidearms. So the an actual value for a balanced game would probably be higher than 5. Sure. But just like with the enemy bullet damage, we're setting a low value, which gives us more room for testing as we get the code up and running. But with these configuration pr parameters in place... I'm actually going to close out the config tab and simply give ourselves some more area to work with. And now we can turn our attention to the attachment class. Inside of game, we'll make a new item, and this class will be attachment. And inside of our attachment class, we'll do some namespace cleanup. We'll establish the fact that attachment extends ship. And if it extends ship, that means it is inherently a game node, and we need to set up the constructor for it. And I'm pausing for just a moment to decide what would be the most convenient constructor to steal. Since we have the health power up open, I'm actually going to jump over and steal its public constructor, simply so that I can focus on the name of the class and don't have to worry about passing along the sprite sheet to the base constructor call. 
And with that, that is how we're going to leave attachment. Again, the purpose of attachment in the current implementation of Space Fighter is a branch in the class hierarchy. This means that if you ever need to add things that are only added to attachments, fields or functionality, that way you add them to the attachment class. And that way you don't have to worry about dirtying the ship class and adding even more and more things and making the entire class more monolithic. So with this as our branch in the class hierarchy, we can pretty much just close the class out. Because again, now that this branch has been established, we now have a base which we can extend into an actual sidearm that we're going to use in the game. So now back to the game folder, we're going to make a new item, this item being the sidearm class. So this is the actual class that will be sticking to the ship, that can be seen, that follows the ship, and if it encounters damage, it will explode. We'll clean up the subname space. We will address the using statement here because we're going to want access to the types in xna.framework. So we'll give ourselves access to Microsoft.xna.framework. The sidearm class itself is going to extend attachment. And since it extends attachment, we're going to need to have our public constructor satisfy the need for a sprite sheet. So once again, I can speed things by stealing the health powerups constructor method signature once again changing the name from power-up health to sidearm, though I will drop the braces down to form a method body, as there are a few things that need to be set inside of the sidearms constructor. The first thing that we're going to address inside of the sidearm is the fact that it needs to be treated like a Like, like an a actual ship. player ship, yeah. That means that we want things to be able to collide with it. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm just going to jot that as a note. Needs to collide. Because I want to show it in place without that first. Because the key thing to remember is the fact that if we've thought about ships a lot in the game, we've, we usually think of the player ship. Or even enemies. So every ship so far we've encountered, we've caused it to collide. But we need to keep in mind that collision is actually set up from player ship, as that is the player ship's list. Just pointing that out ahead of time. I do want to show the sidearm in use before we set this so we can see it in non-colliding mode. Another good reason for showing that is there are shooter-style games that have sidearm power-ups that don't collide. The idea is that the sidearms are highly beneficial because they can't be destroyed. They simply expand your firing capabilities. But um, moving on, there are some final things to set up. These are mainly the settings for a new sidearm. So we'll automatically set up the sidearm's health and what explosion sheet should be used in the event of a sidearm exploding. The health is very simple, as its value is given by the configuration class. That is config.sidearmhealth. And the explosion sprite sheet we're going to use, in this case, we'll simply reuse the projectile explosion. So this explosion sprite sheet will be set to config.projectileexplosion. And moving on from here, let's see. Since I'm kind of pausing just for a moment because I want to get this sidearm into play as soon as possible to show building incrementally. What is the minimum required to get a usable sidearm? So I'm actually going to leave the sidearm as it stands right here. Let's build briefly to make sure that there are no errors. And let's just jump over and attach some to the player ship. So now that we have these sidearms, what is it that we need to do to make our ship spawn with sidearms? If we jump over to the player ship class, what I'll do is I'll move in after we have set up the weapon system and before we set the position. This makes things easier on us as we can assume that the ship is at zero, or its vector, or position vector is at zero, zero if we have not changed it. So what we'll do is we'll spawn the sidearms and then be able to offset them without taking into account the, uh, the ship's position. So we'll make, let's see, to do this, let's make a sidearm temporary variable, and we'll use that for positioning the new instance. So we'll make a sidearm variable called sidearm, and that's equal to a new instance of sidearm. The sprite sheet will give from the config class. Now the next thing we need to do is to set up the position of the sidearm. So the sidearm's position will be equal to a new vector to, 
And now thinking about this for a second, if we haven't moved the ship, the ship is at position zero zero. It's at the origin. So if we simply position the power, or the, excuse me, the sidearm off of the origin, then we shouldn't have to take into the ship's take into account the ship's position at all. So we should be able to make a new vector two. We'll offset. Let's say let's position this at the very right edge of the player's sprite, and then add an extra 20 pixels for padding, so we're not actually laying over the graphic. To do that, we'd make a new vector two of this dot sprite. Of course, this referring to the player ship itself. So this dot sprite dot origin dot x. And that would put us on the right edge of our player ship sprite, and then we'll add an additional 20 pixels to that. Then takes care of our x component, and for the y component. Let's have it rest near the bottom of the the actual player ship sprite. So this dot sprite dot origin dot y, and then we'll move it back up a value of about 20 pixels. Now that the sidearm is positioned, we need to make sure that it gets parented to the player ship so that as the player ship moves, the sidearm moves along with it. So we'll take our sidearm, we'll run set parent, and a new parent will be this the player ship. Now with these lines in place, let's build the code, make sure that there's no errors, and now we're ready to test. And if we test, we see that there is in fact a triangular sidearm. If we move around, we see that that sidearm goes with us. And if something runs into the sidearm, you'll note that there are no collisions yet. And this is where we had specifically commented that the sidearm does need to collide. And this demonstrates the fact that the sidearm is not colliding with anything. The reason I wanted to point that out is the solution to it might not seem incredibly obvious at first, because we might want to be setting up, okay, what is this sidearms collision list? But it's not so much that we want the sidearm to collide with things, we want the things that are checking ship collision to consider the sidearm. The way you can think of it as that is, well, what collides with the ship? Well, enemies and enemy projectiles check for collision with ships, and that's how the enemy-to-ship collision works. So that would mean if we added every new instance of sidearm into that player ships list, then enemies and enemy projectiles would consider the sidearm for collision. And that way the sidearm collision would work in the same manner as the main ship itself. That is, enemies and enemy projectiles would do damage to the sidearm. So in order to establish collision, what we're going to do is we'll take the player ships list, so player ship dot player ships, and we'll add to that list the new instance of sidearm. So I'll add this instance. Now one thing to be careful with here is we're arbitrarily adding ourselves to a player ship's list. So we need to make sure that if the sidearm is ever destroyed, that we actually remove ourselves back out of this list so we never have a case where enemies are firing at and colliding with a ghost sidearm that can no longer be seen because it's been destroyed. In order to accomplish that, we'll simply override the remove method so in the case that we end up getting removed, we'll make sure that we remove ourselves from the player ships list. So player ships dot remove this instance. All right. Now with this line and the override to remove, let's rerun and see what happens when things collide with the sidearm. Well, you notice that enemy projectiles are colliding. And if we slam into an asteroid, the 50 points of damage taken easily take out the sidearm. So we can see that the sidearm is, in fact, being removed. And let me test one final thing, and that is to make sure that the explosion sprite sheet is getting called. I think I saw it, but it was very you did. faint. And ah, Okay, it was next to the, uh, mm -hmm. the projectile that hit it. So that means we have an explosion effect being played. We have the sidearm damageable by projectiles and by enemies. We saw that the projectiles collided and caused the damage flicker, and that asteroids hitting it would simply cause it to explode. Now that we've proven the fact that a sidearm can work, let's make the other sidearm for the other side of the ship. We'll go back into player ship, and we'll copy and paste to duplicate the lines for the sidearm, though we're not going to try to redeclare the sidearm variable. For the second case, we'll just reuse the same variable and set that to a new instance of sidearm. Now, as we position the sidearm, let's set it to the other side of the sprite, that is the player ship sprite. So we'll take the negative origin in X and then subtract an additional 20 pixels. We'll leave the same value for Y. And once we're finished setting it up, we will parent 
that new sidearm to the ship as well. This results in two sidearms on either side of the ship. So both can be damaged, both can be run into, they can be destroyed independently as each are their, their own entity, their own instance. And we have damageable and destroyable sidearms. Nice. All right, now there's one final thing to consider. As a matter of fact, one point that I didn't show with the collision. Not only are we colliding with enemies, we're also able to collide with power-ups. Now, let's see. I'll take some damage on the ship, and I'll wait just a minute for power-ups to begin spawning. Now that I've taken damage... Actually, I missed that one. Let's see what happens when I grab health power-ups with the sidearm. you notice that my health hasn't actually gone up at all. And that is... To begin with, it might be an interesting problem until you think about it for a second. What is actually happening when sidearms collide with health power-ups? Because we see the power-up getting picked up, but what happens? Well, to show exactly what's happening, we can go into the health power-up. Let's set a breakpoint, or excuse me, not even the health power-up. Let's go all the way back up to the power-up class and set a breakpoint inside of Collide where we do a, a check to see if the incoming game node is a ship or not. With this breakpoint set, let's go up and hit the health power up with the sidearm. Breakpoint is hit, and let's see, the ship is set to null. That means the node, ah, the node is a sidearm. A sidearm is not a player ship. Therefore, we never make our call to apply power up and no health is applied. Now, in our case, with sidearms, the behavior that I'd like to establish is that the sidearms allow you to collect power ups for the main ship instead of having them affect the individual sidearms themselves. So it's almost like an expansion of the ship with a greater area covered by the sidearms that gives us a greater area to collect power-ups. The thing that needs to be changed, though, is for the sidearm collision to pass the effect back up to whatever the root node of this hierarchy branch is. Because if you think about it, the hierarchy we have in place with the player ship and two sidearms is the root node is the actual player ship. The two children are the two sidearms. So we need some calculation that will be able to walk the hierarchy back up to the root. Once we find the root, we know that that is our player ship, and that is the thing that needs to have the power up effect applied to. Now, in order to accomplish this, we're going to add a little bit of functionality to the original node class. We'll add a function that does just what we had explained. We'll have something that will walk from the current location in the hierarchy up to the highest root that it possibly can, the root node of the overall hierarchy, and return that node. To do that, we need to grab our node class, so I'll expand, expand the engine folder, and we'll load up the original node class. I'll scroll all the way down near the bottom, right after perform, and while we have our attention on the perform method, we can go ahead and address one small spelling issue with that. And that is swapping the R and the E. So we actually have perform instead of preformed as the meaning. Right. Um, if we change that, we also need to change the subsequent call inside of the recursive loop to the same perform as well. And again, just a very minor spelling correction there. Um, I'll go ahead and handle that as we're pointing it out here. In general. Now, what we came in here to node into node to do is to set up functionality that gets the root node based off of whatever place we may be in a hierarchy. To do this, we'll make a method called get root that returns a node. We'll also make this method public. So public return type is node, name is get root. There will be no parameters as this is meant to be called on an instance of node. So a block in the method body and we'll set up the implementation. The way this will work is we'll first establish a node variable. This will, in, this will end up being the node that gets returned. And we'll initialize this node to be the value of this, well, this specific instance. So that way on a, pol, on a pol call to get root, we initialize node to whatever the current node is. Because if you think about it, if we had a node that was a root node and we called get root, it would have to return itself. Now, it would return something other than itself if it has a parent node. So that means the next check is we need to see if it's parented, and then if that parent has a parent, and subsequently if that parent in turn has a parent. So we'll perform the check with a while loop, and that way we'll continue to walk up the hierarchy until we find something that does not have a parent. So to put this while loop into place, the while check will be while node, the node variable, is not equal, or excuse me, while node.parent is not equal to null. 
So that means we've gotten the node, we've set initialized it to ourselves, so we've asked, okay, does us as ourselves have a parent? If not, actually, if it, uh, actually, instead of not, if it does have a parent, we need to continue looping. So that means that the loop will continue, but we'll also set the node variable equal to the node's current setting dot parent. That is, we're checking the node's parent. If that was not null, we actually set that parent to be the value we're looking at in node. And that way, through a simple flat, or excuse me, linear loop, we can actually walk up the hierarchy. This is opposed to the for loop that has to branch out to loop all things in a downwards direction. So that way, every time we grab a node, if it has a parent, we store that parent in node. So that way, if that subsequent parent has a parent, then we put that in node. If that parent has another parent, we put that in node until we find a node that doesn't have a parent. Then we dump out of the while loop and we'll return that node. So whatever node ended up being the node with no parent is the node that gets returned by the get root method. Now that we have get root functionality, we can go back to the power up class and adjust how it works. Because we know that we now have a possibility where a power up can end up colliding with a sidearm. So that means that we can't do a simple check where we cast the given node. So if we tried to cast a sidearm to a player ship, we simply assume that that was an invalid action for a power up. So instead, what we'll do is we'll say, we'll take node.getRoot and cast that node to a player ship. Because now if we ask a sidearm to get its root, that's going to end up being a player ship. And the nice thing about using this functionality is it's not limited as to how many parents it will search through. That means if we had a sidearm parented to an asteroid, parented to a rock, parented to a support beam, parented to another sidearm, then parented to the ship, that still causes the effect to be applied to the ship and only the main player ship. So with this change in place, let's build and run and test our new functionality. I'll take some damage, so we're now down to 76 health, and as the power-up collides with the sidearm, we get the added health of that power-up. So now that we've dropped the health more considerably, that gets us back to 74, and waiting for a second one, 99. So we see that health power-ups are collected by the sidearms, but their effects are applied to the main player ship as though the player ship is what was collided with the power-up. That's right. Now, of course, at this point, this doesn't mean that we are finished with power-ups. If you want to run it again real quick, can demonstrate one, we can't fire with them. That's right. If we fire, we see only the main ship firing. The power-ups do nothing as far as firing is concerned. But the cool thing is, since a sidearm is an attachment and an attachment is a ship, the ship has the capability of having weapons and projectiles. That's right. Just to point out, remember that attachment extends ship. Ship has fire action That's and right. ship has weapon. That's right. And another thing that we're going to take a look at, and that is right now, if an attachment, one of these sidearms, gets destroyed or even just takes damage. You'll see the little uh, explosion rings. But if the ship itself is destroyed... Well, let's take a look at what happens in that case. If we manage to destroy the ship... Watch the sidearms for any sort of explosion. There's, there's none. There's none. They just disappear. And the trick there is the fact that we now have a hierarchy of things all being removed at once. So that means, by the nature of a hierarchy will remove, everything in the hierarchy gets directly removed. Explosion only happens from take damage. Since they're not taking damage, they're just being directly removed, we don't see the effect. And at the moment, there's no way to tell an entire hierarchy of things to all explode at the same time. Therefore, no explosion is seen. That's right. So these will be things that will need to be addressed in the next video. So with that, that is going to wrap up this video. Thanks a lot.